Crossgen's quarterly title, called Crossgen Chronicles, was created with one purpose in mind, to give penciler George Perez time and space to draw. George Perez is a legend in the American comics industry. He got his start in 1973, but he debuted at Marvel Comics in 1974 with Astonishing Tales issue 25. Perez was roughly 20 years old at the time. He has drawn the Avengers. He is perhaps more famous, though, for his recreation of the Teen Titans into the new Teen Titans with author Marv Wolfman. He drew DC's Crisis on Infinite Earths, relaunched Wonder Woman in the 1980s, designed Lex Luthor's famous battle armor, and he was the original artist on Marvel's Infinity Gauntlet story, although he had to stop for various reasons that I'm not going to get into here. I personally know Perez best as the penciler of Avengers Volume 3, which he drew for almost the entirety of three years. Perez also drew the probably never going to happen again JLA Avengers crossover miniseries. Then, obviously, in 2001, he was hired by CrossGen. This was a big name for the still new publisher. While artists like Jim Chung and Brandon Peterson were successful at the time, they also weren't names that sold books either. Perez who had worked in the industry for 30 years with some of the very best writers on some of the biggest titles, was the kind of artist that comic fans would notice. Getting him to work for CrossGen was quite the big deal. But there was a downside. Due to health reasons, Perez couldn't keep up with a monthly publishing schedule. CrossGen designed Chronicles to be a quarterly book, giving Perez more than enough time to complete his work. Each issue is a standalone issue, completing its own story, but each issue is also set within the world of a different cross-gen comic book. So, for example, issue 2 explores Avalon, while issue 3 is set within the history of Demetria, the world that another book, Meridian, takes place on. This kept the audience from getting frustrated with a four-month wait for another issue of a single story, but it also ensured that the stories would matter, that they would have depth and impact on the individual titles. Plus, due to the downtime, the Chronicles could be bigger books. Today's issue clocks in at 32 pages of uninterrupted, ad-free goodness. Perez would only draw four issues total before health concerns meant a break and then a return to a different book entirely. But the work that he produced was gorgeous! Perez is an artist unlike any other. His characters have a weight, a realism to them that few other artists can do. He makes sure to sculpt faces so that each person looks unique, and he uses lots of lines for sculpting, detail work, and lighting effects. Despite this, his artwork is always clean and rounded. I've been putting together a collection of Avengers Volume 3 recently, and Perez's issues are just the best issues of it. He can draw people, vehicles, energy effects, monsters, landscapes, costume, both of the skin type and the more practical variety. He can draw sci-fi stuff, fantasy stuff, real-world stuff. Perez is just a truly talented and skilled individual. And given the amount of time that he was able to put in each issue of Chronicles, oh, it is especially pretty. Published in March of 2001, CrossGen Chronicles Issue 2 is set on the world of Avalon, where our current title of focus, Scion, is set. I've debated since the start of this series how much of the broader CrossGen continuity I would explore as I covered the book. There are things that, if we were reading more titles, we would already know, or we would at least have more knowledge of those things. But most of that information doesn't really impact on Scion's story, either, so for the most part, I've been okay with ignoring it. Today's issue, though, is another matter. Despite being an issue of CrossGen Chronicles, this is basically a bonus issue of Scion. It is written by author Ron Mars, it touches on Ethan and Skink in the Ravenlands, and it also sets up Braun's next move. It is ignorable. If we didn't cover this issue, we could follow our ongoing narrative just fine, and Scion would continue to be an excellent book. But there is some really great world building that happens here, and so I don't just want to skip it either. So I'm going to cover it. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 18.5, Scion. The past is prologue. 
After a quick introduction page which covers the basic idea of Avalon and the events of Scion up to Issue 9, we get into the main meat of the story. There are events that happen in Issue 9 that help indicate that this issue has to happen between 8 and 9. Ethan and Skink have returned to the Raven Lands, and we find them at a campfire for the night. Ethan has been chopping wood with his sword, the length of it glowing with energy from his sigil. He tells Skink that he has not missed the irony of the sword's design being based on his ancestor, Edvin, who helped to bring peace, and he is using that blade to fight a war. Sitting on a nearby log, Skink reminds Ethan that destiny chooses us. We don't choose our destiny. There's no sense blaming yourself for something that was out of your control. Bitterly, Ethan asks, What do you mean, like the war? Like Artor's death? Ethan says that he knows the truth, that none of that would have happened if he hadn't been branded by the sigil. He tosses some more wood onto the fire and then sits. Rather than celebrate his birthday, he got to set two countries back to war, and now he plans to use the sword that brought peace to a world to kill a raven prince. Ethan's having a pretty big pity party. Avenging Artor is a matter of honor, Skink reminds him. No one is questioning that. Besides, King Dane saw Ethan's birth on the anniversary of peace as a good omen. Staring into the flames, Ethan says that Edvin was always held up to him as an ideal. Not that he's lived up to his ancestors' deeds. He looks at the hilt of the blade, resting against the log next to him, and the camera begins to zoom in on it. Flames flicker in front of the camera. Edvin was the admiral of the Heron fleet, Ethan says, brother to the king. The peacemaker. Then we shift back in time 200 years. The camera remains focused on the blade during the transition, but now the flames have turned into mist. The sword hangs from the hip of Edvin, and the camera finishes pulling out. Our new lead character stands at the prow of a ship, cutting quite a figure. Middle-aged, Edvin is dressed one part pirate and one part fantasy warrior. Silver armor, designed after a heron, naturally, hugs his chest, covering a male shirt underneath. White pants are tucked into black leather boots. Armored gauntlets cover his hands, and a billowing coat of blue twists behind him. He has a small goatee and long blonde hair, with several braids in it. Edvin orders the helmswoman to keep the ship steady. He knows that they're out there. He just can't find them in this damn fog. Edvin turns, looking at a fish-headed lesser races named Grum. He doesn't like this kind of cat-and-mouse game. It's too hard to tell who is the hunter and who is the hunted. Grum informs him of news. There's weather coming down from the north. Things are going to get worse. Sure, Edvin replies. Why not? This whole trip has sucked so far, so why not suck some more? And also that we can kill more men. He continues complaining, saying that the two kingdoms don't even know why they are fighting anymore. They're all fools. But his brother is the king, and he can't argue with that. The lookout shouts for the admiral. Sighting to port! The deck of the ship is covered in people, some of them looking at the sighting, others still working. Edvin moves through them with ease, climbing onto the railing, holding on to a rope. He shouts for a spyglass, and Grum is right behind, passing him one. Come on, he mutters. Show yourself. The panels become the view through the glass as he peers into the mist. It takes some time, but sure enough, there is something there. A moment passes, then two, and then the ship clears the mist. It is a red and black ship, the bow looking like a black bird. The red sail has a circular emblem in its center, and sure enough, it's the raven symbol. Edvin lowers the glass. It's them. Edvin starts shouting orders, preparing the crew for battle. As he does so, Edvin climbs the stairs up to the helm and gives orders to the helmswoman. A chorus of, Aye, sir! go up around the ship as he moves. One way or another, Edvin says to himself, the war is going to end today. Helmswoman holds steady, he says. He wants to look Alexei in the eye before they fire on him. 
The helmswoman does as she's told, but asks about the incoming storm. Screens that are built into her wheel report that a storm is closing in fast. It might become a northern gale at this rate. Edvin's eyes don't leave the enemy ships. What would you like me to do about it, he asks. Leave nature to her business. We have our own work to consider. Three more ships appear from the mists. A blast of flame suddenly bursts on the heron sails, burning a hole through the heron symbol. Debris litters the deck as Edvin admires the shot. Alexei is both more prepared and a better shot than Edvin gave him credit for. He orders the gunners to present, but hold fire on his command. Portholes open in the side of the ship, and crackling circular fields extend out, some sort of energy weapon. Edvin tells the helmswomen to turn hard aport on his command. Wait. Wait. Now, fire! Grum shouts the order as well, and the ship suddenly turns and opens fire. One of the energy blasts slams into the nearest raven craft. A cheer goes up around the ship, but Edvin warns them to stay calm. That's only the first blow. They'll try to chase him down now. Come about and reload! Grum again passes the orders along, and the crew makes them a reality. In the gutters of this two-page spread, we see raven ships battling heron ships, the waves churning and splashing with explosions and fire and debris. As the skies darken, the helmswoman shouts, They mean to ram us! Edvin has just enough time to shout, Brace for impact! And then a sound like the world cracking open erupts around them as the two ships collide. Men and women topple off into the waters. Both of the ship's masts crack. Grum shouts that the bow has stove in. They're sinking fast. Gripping a rope, Edvin says that if their ship won't float, then that they'll have to take the ravens. He draws his sword and looks to his crew. Unless you lot want to swim home. Are you with me, mates? As one, the crowd shouts, Aye! In a flash of lightning, Edvin swings through the air, repeating a familiar battle cry. For king and kingdom! The herons move onto the raven ship, and the bloody work begins. The deck becomes wet with seawater, the rain, and blood. After working through a few of the ravens, Edvin hears his name shouted. He turns, and there stands Alexei of the Ravens. Like Edvin, Alexei is middle-aged, although he is in good shape for his age. His face is a bit more worn, maybe. His right eye has been replaced with a glass symbol of the ravens. Black mutton chops connect to his mustache, but his chin is bare. Long black hair is worn back in a ponytail. His own set of armor is, of course, red, black, and silver. His own sword is drawn already. It's pointed at Edvin, and it's bloody. Alexei says that he's glad to see Edvin. He didn't want him to die drowning. He wants him gutted on his blade. They fought each other, what, four or five times now? Edvin stares at his counterpart. Five. Fine then, five. But always with their ships, never one-on-one -on -one like this. Never like this. Lightning cracks the sky again, and they charge. The two men clash steel as the storm and battle rages on around them. We learn while they're fighting that Edvin is responsible for Alexei losing his eye. One fighter slashes the other, another kicks at their opponent. Edvin grabs a rope near the mast as the ship pitches. He says that he will lash himself to the ship if that's what it takes to end this fight. But suddenly, another soldier falls back into him. Edvin is pushed to the deck. His sword slips from his grasp, and it falls into the ocean. Alexei manages to stand over him, his sword pointed to stab downward. This storm will claim them all, he says, but I will kill you first. He doesn't, though. A wave reaches up over the ship, and then it comes back down. Alexei, Edvin, and the whole ship are shoved underwater. After a few moments, Alexei manages to swim to the surface. He grabs a piece of debris, struggling to keep his head above the water. After taking a moment to catch his breath, Alexei smiles. <laughs> I beat him. I finally beat him, he shouts. And then Edvin leaps from the water, wrapping his arms around Alexei's throat. Drowning is a bad way to go, isn't it? He manages to ask, before another wave crashes down upon them, and they're gone. This book is so easy to read that it is quite easy to just pass by how intense all of this is. 
but goram is it intense. There have been a lot of rainstorms in my area recently, and I can feel the pressure of this storm blowing in. Edvin is annoyed at the thick fog, worried for his crew and his own life. But the second that he spots his enemy, he is on it, ready and eager. Obviously, we're meeting Edvin for the first time, and there are a lot of parallels to Ethan, and that's not really that surprising. He is brother of the heir, so royalty, yes, but he is also in a position of responsibility, but he is not the king himself. What he does is reflect on the crown, but he also isn't the one wearing it. He feels totally comfortable at sea here, both in his dress and his mannerisms. This isn't some royal rich guy who goes boating for the fun of it, or who was gifted his position in the navy thanks to his well-connected brother. It feels like he has earned this admiralty and the loyalty of his crew. I love that he has Grum as his second in command. That is a good way to highlight the slightly more progressive Heron policy towards the lesser races. No one questions when Grum passes along an order or gives him any crap. They just do it. They respect his position and they trust him, and that is great to see. We also see that Edvin is tired of the war. He vocally complains about it, but he is also so used to the war that he doesn't question participating in it either. We know from Sion that Edvin is going to help bring peace to the two nations, and so him being sick of the war and questioning its merits makes some degree of sense. But then he spots an enemy ship and he is ready to go. His life has been war, and it is a bit hard for him to let that go, even if he doesn't realize it. Alexei is a good match for Braun, generally darker, maybe a bit older, definitely a bit meaner. While his hair is worn long, thanks to the ponytail, it mostly just looks short, and it makes the resemblance to Braun very clear. And the eye that Alexei is missing is the same eye that Braun had slashed, echoing the injury. I'm a little annoyed that Alexei blames Edvin for the loss of his eye, given that he also says that they have never fought each other one-on-one -on -one before. Only on ships. And sure, shrapnel from a cannon blast could easily have taken Alexei's eye out, but that's like accidental damage, not intentional damage. But I mean, Edvin would have been attacking his ship intentionally, if that's how it happened, so wouldn't that make it intentional and then justify his anger? Ah, I'm just, I'm just nitpicking. This isn't a big deal. It's just one of those things that I wish the story had more time to explore, and we don't, because we only have the one issue. Artistically, I cannot verbally do these pages justice. Perez varies his page layouts and his panel designs throughout, so one page is all squares and blocks, while another one is circular spyglass panels, while another one is a two-page spread of the ships colliding with smaller inset panels showing individual fates. He also does a lot of more artistic designs. There's a one panel where Edvin says something weighty and Perez uses about half of the page to have him look into the sky and we get a shot from below his chin but he combines the shape of Edvin's lower face and neck area with the design of the ship and the other heron boats behind it, blending the two together. It is a neat-looking panel. A lesser artist would not have been able to pull something like that off nearly as well, and it just, ooh, it just impresses me. Overall, the artwork is super detailed, like no two people on the ship look alike at all. Some artists would have just put the background workers, you know, in shirts and pants, maybe a hat or a bandana or give somebody a hook for a hand. But Perez gives each one of those characters an individual look with ornate, detailed costumes. Like I mentioned before, he also uses the gutters between some panels to kind of help set the scene, showing us that there are more battles happening than just Edvin's ship versus Alexei's ship, which we don't really get to see. During some of the more chaotic moments, he makes the panel borders really jagged and sharp, indicating that rough action stuff is happening within them. Obviously, from a coloring perspective, we get a lot of blues here. We are at sea, in a storm, and the herons are generally blue and white colored, so yeah, we got the blues! But colorist Laura Dupuis does a great job of making sure that the colors blend when necessary and shift as the tone shifts. When we open Edvin's scene, it's all light blues and grays. But as the other ships approach and the storm closes in, things get darker. And that's a great bit of transition. 
We have two inkers on this issue, Dennis Jensen and Rick Magyar, both of whom ink about half of the book. For the most part, the inking is kept tight to Perez's pencils, and they are kept smooth and easy. I mentioned the last episode that penciler Rick Leonardi has a much smoother style than Scion's regular artist, Jim Chung, who is fairly pointy. But Perez is smooth personified. Everything just has smooth, curving lines, except for things that need to be messy. The waves do get a bit choppy, the broken ships look sharp and jagged, so it's not like the inkers are just going over Perez's lines. They are doing work here, adding depth and weight to these objects. And, of course, Perez does some mood lighting, so it's not like everything is just bright and colorful, either. That moment when Edvin leaps from his ship to the Ravens? That is a two-page spread, and Edvin is shouting as he swings through the air with black clouds rolling behind him, the sky split by lightning. Ah, it's just so flooping cool. This book is so pretty. I cannot talk about how pretty this book is and, and do it any degree of justice. I sincerely suggest, if you have a chance or you have the time, hop on Google, type in CrossGen Chronicles, and just stare at the artwork that comes up. Uh, I have looked at getting some CrossGen artwork in the past, and there are no CrossGen Chronicles pages available online that I've been managed to find. And to be fair, they're George Perez pages, so they are priced way outside of anything that I could afford. Uh, but that just goes to show you how precious those pages are that no one wants to get rid of them. They're amazing looking. Eventually, within the comic, the seas calm. Sunlight brightens the surface from deep blue to a shimmering lighter shade. The new day is clear, bright, and sunny. Yellow clouds fluff in the sky as the surf laps at Alexei's face. He comes to and pushes himself up, discovering that he is washed up on an island. Pieces of the ships litter the shore all around him. Avalon's equivalent of seagulls dart through the air and pick through the sand and scraps. Fighting to remember, all Alexei can recall is the water and Edvin. He holds his head in pain. Someone else from his crew must have survived. If he did, then someone else could have. Alexei picks a direction and walks the beach, battered, tired, and sore. He crests a rise in the sand, and his eyes go wide. No. No, it can't be. Laying on the sand, maybe 40 feet away, is Edvin. What must I do to be free of you? Alexei shouts. He draws a knife from his belt and charges at Edvin. This helps bring Edvin around, and soon the pair are back to fighting again. They use debris as weapons. They throw sand in each other's faces. The two men kick, punch, and wrestle with all the strength that they can muster, after already being in combat and nearly drowning. As they fight, other survivors, some of them Heron, some of them Raven, gather into two separate groups. Surprisingly, neither group really wants to interrupt, and neither Alexei or Edvin seem to notice them. That hate is so personal that they end up fighting all day. Like, we get to watch the sun set behind them. As night closes in around them, they are separated, and they are beaten, bruised, and panting. Alexei speaks, but it's barely audible. <sighs> this, this can't go on. Edvin agrees. Alexei, Alexei can't even remember why they are fighting. But if it doesn't stop, they're just going to keep doing this. He staggers to his feet, and he offers Edvin his hand. Let's end this, he says. Let peace begin with us. And Edvin shakes his hand. Agreed. He then tells the witnesses here to take this site back to their homelands. The war won't end until both sides agree to stop, and they are going to have to lead the way. Stumbling through the sand, Alexei picks up his knife and raises it into the air. For just a second, Edvin looks at him fearfully, but then Alexei plunges it into the sand. Let no one forget that on this day... In this place, east and west came together and no one was slain. Let it be thus forevermore. The camera zooms in on the dagger's hilt, and once more we move through time. 
but this time we travel 200 years into the future. Alexei's dagger sits nicely in a glass display case, which is unceremoniously shattered. Prince Braun holds the dagger in his bleeding hand. Our ancestor was a fool. Braun and his father are in a study, or something along the lines of a trophy room. A blazing fire fills the fireplace in one side of the room. Books, pieces of artwork, and trophies line the walls. More display cases, ornate chairs, a few small tables, and a rug cover the floor. A fool? the king asks. Is that what you think? Braun then makes his case. Alexei not only forged the peace with the herons, he is also the one who started the tournament and built the arena on the tournament aisle. If it wasn't for Alexei, the ravens would have wiped the herons from the face of this planet. The king raises an eyebrow at this. What you see as weakness may have been a necessity then. Their nation's resources have been badly depleted by decades of war. They needed a chance to recover, and Alexei bought them that time. Now the Raven Nation is ready to make war again. Is it the thought of peace that bothers Braun, or is it his scar? Braun holds the knife up so that his father can see it. That whelp will pay. He'll use this very blade to slit his throat. You can see the struggle on the king's face. One day, Braun will take the throne, but he must be the one to rule it. He cannot let his anger rule him. His temper is neither befitting a king nor one of royal blood. Think about this advice, he warns his son. Then he moves to leave the room, telling Braun to summon a servant to clean this mess up. But keep in mind, there won't always be someone to clean up your messes. Braun watches him go. Once his father is out of the room, he mutters, quote, Keep looking down your nose at me, old man. You'll never see me behind you. End quote. He then walks out onto a balcony, taking in the night air. Even if he has to take the throne, he will have it. And Ethan's head. That is the main thing that I wanted to make sure that we got out of this issue. The Raven King has been very dismissive of Braun's feelings. We saw him blame Braun for Ethan's escape back in issue 3, we saw him berate Braun in issue 8, and threaten his inheritance. And in classic fantasy storytelling way, Braun does not intend to let that go peacefully. Again, you do not tell a bad prince that you're not going to let them be king. They will always kill you for it. And Braun sure is starting to look patricidal in this issue. I get the feeling that the Raven King was always hard on Braun, but as a child, he didn't understand why, and so he internalized that constant criticism. Then, feeling bad emotionally, he probably treated others poorly, and being the prince, no one could really correct that behavior. I could totally see Ashley pulling away from her family and finding solace and friendship within the lesser races servants instead, while Court was forced to go along with whatever it was that young Braun wanted him to. But we also get some interesting tidbits from our flashback. While Edvin was a character that we have heard a lot about, Alexei is brand new to us, and he was the one who proposed the peace. Obviously, we have seen the Raven King eager for war, Braun is certainly eager for violence, and Ashley is cool with starting trouble for the underground. This is a very action-based family. The only examples of ravens that we have seen so far have been very warlike, and yet it is Alexei who proposed peace. Not Edvin, who Ethan specifically called the peacemaker, but Alexei, the raven. That is surprising. And I like that. But it also feels kind of wrong, right? All of the work that Mars has done up to this point is setting up Edvin as the Peacemaker. And I'm not talking just the build-up in the previous issues either, but all of the storytelling that we get here. We hear Edvin complain about how long the war has gone on. We see his tired, disinterested gaze. And like I said, sure, once battle is upon him, he dives into it, but it is clear that this isn't his driving motivation either. He is honestly here out of loyalty to his brother, his king, and so he fights because he must. But if he was the one who proposed the peace, we would have a better understanding of why. With Alexei, we don't get that. 
we don't get any of that. The first time that we see him, he is reciting how many times that he and Edvin have fought, and he is swearing that this will be the last time. And when he thinks that Edvin is lost to the sea for even just a moment, he celebrates. This does not feel like a man who is tired of war or death or combat. This feels like a man who wants those things. Him proposing the peace comes from nowhere, and it feels kind of unsatisfactory that he is the one who ultimately gets the credit. Now, to play the role of devil's advocate, there is a part of me that likes the idea of Alexei establishing the peace. I like that his entire family is so war-focused, and as such, the audience's expectation is that he is the same way, but he's not. And I also think the fact that we have never heard of him before now is a good way to show how biased each of the nations is in their storytelling. In the Heronlands, Edvin gets the credit because it makes the Herons look good, while in the East... The same is probably true of Alexei, at least maybe to everybody except Braun. That is a very realistic take on nationalist propaganda, and I like that twist, if that is what Mars was going for. And, full credit to Edvin for agreeing to the peace in the first place. It is one thing to say, hey man, we should like really stop this, this is kind of old and, and gross and I don't like it anymore. It is another thing entirely to trust your lifelong enemy who has lost his eye to you and blames you for it, and make an ally out of him. Alexei could easily have stabbed Edvin, thrown him, pulled him in close, and choked him out. But Edvin was willing to believe and trust Alexei, and we know that Avalon got 200 years of peace out of it. It took both of these men to establish the peace, and Mars' story allows for the both of them to do it. If Braun ever tried something like that with Ethan, I am sure that he would be planning to stab him in the back as soon as possible. And it's that kind of expectation that makes this issue's twist neat. I would have liked some higher stakes, though. Once you get past the initial sea battle and are on the island, there isn't really an escalation of violence or a form of a climax. The dudes fight, they get tired, they quit fighting forever, hurrah. I think that the scene would have played out a bit more dramatically if Alexei was winning, like maybe he had his arm around Edvin's throat and he was choking him out, but then he looks up and he sees the herons watching, and it hits him. If he kills Edvin, they'll kill him, and then his crew will fight, and then maybe some of them will get killed, and for what? The ability to keep on killing? Or maybe they could have done this like a buddy cop style with the back half of the book being Alexei and Edvin ashore or on some other part of the island and they have to work together in order to survive, but then they discover that their men are fighting and they have to stop them. This was a fun story. It is certainly a good read and it is beautiful to look at, but I do think that it is missing a little oomph. I just want a little more weight to it. I also like how Mars balances the storytelling within the comic. The book opens on Ethan relating the story of Edvin to Skink, and we even get the cool visual shift of zooming in on Ethan's weapon turning into Edvin's weapon, and then we end our flashback with the same kind of visual shift, but on Alexei's weapon shifting into Braun's hand, with Braun and the King discussing the impact of the story that we were just told. It makes the story feel more like it is a piece of family history, and not just some history lesson that we are being forced to learn. But it's also a cool way to show that the Heron and Raven nations really aren't all that different. Only their ideologies and their reading of history are different. Where Ethan looks to Edvin as a hero, an unreachable example of how to do the right thing, Braun looks at Alexei and sees his compassion as a weakness. And that is a character trait that we see reflected in his treatment of the lesser races and, to some degree, in his new desire to maybe potentially murder his father. This is part of why Mars made Edvin and Alexei so generally similar to Ethan and Braun in their personalities, rivalry, and physical design. Given what this story was exploring, it is less important to establish the two men as individual characters, and it is more important to reflect Ethan and Braun's struggle and show how their fight could go down. The Herons and the Ravens have found peace once before. Ethan could always choose a better road than murder. He's already been questioning the need for this war and its costs. We can see Edvin reflected at Ethan and vice versa. 
but is avenging Artor's death worth the lives that it is going to take to end this conflict? We'll find out. We certainly have more comics to read. One of the nice things about this particular issue is that there are new creator bios in the back of the book, uh, because CrossGen was expanding their publishing line at this point. There is a preview of Chronicles Issue 3 and biographies for its creative team, as well as promos and biographies for CrossGen's 6th and 7th ongoing series, books that were named Crooks and Sojourn, respectively. If you were a regular reader of Scion, and you picked up this issue, BAM! You got built-in ads for more of Crossgen's line that you might just be interested in. The best marketing is the marketing that doesn't feel like marketing. And man, did it get me good. Having finished this nice interlude, I think that it's high time that we got back to the present day and our boys Ethan and Skink. Next week, Ethan and Skink encounter an unexpected and familiar face as they continue their trek in search of the underground in issue 9. Then in issue 10, Ethan meets an even more unexpected face as he is visited by a ghost. Join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown episode 18.6, Scion, Strange Encounters. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. 